now that you've gotten an overview of the different levels uh, in Shine's model of culture, the idea of artifacts, values, and basic assumptions, um, let's dive a little bit deeper into what each of these mean. So first, let's talk about uh, observable artifacts uh, from Shine's model. Uh, these come in various forms. What Shine suggests is they come in the form of myths and stories, symbols and artifacts, rites and, rit rites and rituals, uh, and language. And again, these are the things that you can observe. If you're an outside observer, you can come into an organization. You can walk into your unit. Your first day as a new division officer, a new platoon commander, you can take a look at and start to hear the myths and the stories. You can see the symbols and the artifacts. You can be aware of the rites and the rituals, and you will start to speak the language. Now, as an outsider, you may not fully understand what all of these things mean. You might not even recognize them as myths and stories and symbols, uh, et cetera, and, and, and what these artifacts are. And that's why you need to drill down into the values uh, and the underlying assumptions. We'll talk about that. But I do want to spend a little bit of time here. And so we do talk about myths and stories. What are the stories that we hear? What are the, the tales that get told? Um, you know, and what do they say about us, right? So we all know the, the story, or you should know the story of uh, Butch Ferguson and Philo McGiffin. And what do they tell us about uh, the culture of the Navy and the culture of the Naval Academy, and maybe a little bit about uh, kind of celebrating the Maverick uh, and and even what it means to be a rule breaker a little bit uh, at the Naval Academy and in the Navy as uh, as an organization that that celebrates and owns independence uh, and proactive leadership uh, and knowing what those stories say. Same thing with symbols and artifacts. We look at logos. Uh, we look at posters that are up and what we use for those, what are those communicating uh, to people? What are we intending to communicate and are we actually communicating? them? What are the rites and rituals? And look, a lot of times as an officer, you may not be aware of all the rites and rituals, uh, especially right away. You should make it your job to understand what the rites and rituals are in your organization. And of course, you'll ad adopt uh, the language. Let me give a very much closer, home, closer to home example uh, of this. I have often asked uh, various classes to take a look at their companies, right? Their companies at the Naval Academy and think about their culture around, uh, around getting good grades. Uh, and, and how do they know the different cultures around getting good grades? And what we find is that each company actually has a different culture around this. So the first thing we can look at is what are the myths and the stories? Uh, I had a midshipman tell me once about this story that gets told and passed down uh, in her company about a firstie uh, who got his service assignment, uh, was running into the, begin uh, the, the spring of firstie year, and then uh, just really got a bad case of senioritis, stopped working hard, started to fail his classes, and ended up losing his service assignment. And so this is a story that gets told that passes on valuable um, information to future generations about the importance of studying and the importance of, of, of being academic. Symbols and artifacts, what are the things that we see around us? Uh, look, take a look at your wardroom. Does it have, uh, does it have lots of books in it? Does it have uh, uh, posters that suggest that people need to be out studying? Look at the academic officer's uh, poster board in your company area. Does it include uh, schedules on it? Does it have uh, different tutoring assignments on it? Does it have ways for people to help people? These are all symbols that are going to be out there. Or is it just a big blank uh, uh, poster with maybe a, a movie quote on it or something like that? Again, what is this communicating to your followers, to your sailors and marines, to your fellow midshipmen about what you value? And again, we can look at logos. Look at your company logo. Uh, what, does it, what values does that logo suggest? Uh, I'll tell you that over the past 20 years that I've been, uh, 20 plus years that I've been in the Navy, we've seen a real shift in logos and uh, uh, symbols and artifacts in the form of logos for units. Um, there was a time when it was not unusual to get formal or even informal logos uh, that were very sexually suggestive or that were very degrading to women uh, or to certain minority groups uh, or certainly could be not with a whole lot of imagination, easily interpreted to be degrading. Then the question is, what does that tell? What exactly, what kind of culture are we trying to bring to people? And that's why we really had to take a hard 
uh, look at that and change that. Again, I, I've talked before uh, when I was uh, OIC of a security detachment in Bahrain. Uh, when I first got there, uh, the, the logo for the unit, we didn't really have our own, and so it had been created locally. And it was uh, this kind of, it was a Sons of Anarchy skull with crossed rifles behind it. Uh, and, uh, and my Commodore said, man, it looks like we're a motorcycle gang. And, uh, and look, I'll be honest, I didn't really see the problem with it. Uh, but my Commodore being smarter than me came in and said, uh, uh, Dave, you need to get rid of that. I want that painted over in the next month. Uh, and you need to come up with something else. And, you know, I gave a smart eye, eye sir, and, uh, and didn't really understand it. But as I've come to understand what culture is and how it gets passed on and understanding symbols and artifacts, what I realize is when we allow ourselves to say that, oh, we're pirates and we include that into our, or Sons of Anarchy, we include that into our logos, it may be cool and it might, be, it might even be edgy and, and, and really build morale, but, but what does it suggest about professionalism? And what does it suggest about how we follow ethical rules and how we comply with procedures and how we adhere to the formal structures around us when we promote uh, those kinds of things? So again, this is a, a great example of how symbols and artifacts uh, influence culture and how they can also be uh, uh, symbols to us or, or, or directions to us about what the culture of a particular organization is. Uh, again, the rites and rituals uh, that we have, uh, whether it's taking the oath of office, or if you think about when you, when you come into second class year uh, and we have a big formal ceremony around signing food for seven. Uh, I can tell you when I was a midshipman, uh, it was just a party. We didn't do anything formal like that. We didn't really spend time thinking about the ethics uh, and what we were signing up to do. We had a big two for seven party and you know, we all got beer mugs. And uh, on the one hand, okay, that's fun, uh, and it was a neat thing to pass down. But on the other hand, what did that tell us? But now we can go back and we can look at this elaborate ceremony that we've created around two for seven uh, and the gravity that it imparts on this decision that you're making when you commit yourself to the Navy and Marine Corps uh, for the following seven years. So again, these are the rites and rituals, but that's a big rite and ritual. We can even look at things like what is the weekly schedule? Do we do training every day? Uh, when training occurs every day, that imparts a culture of training. If we don't talk about training and it's not included in the daily plan, you know, it only comes around when it has to be, well, that says something different that's going to impart a certain culture uh, around training. So even looking at our daily schedule and understanding what that tells us, that's a rite and ritual itself. And of course, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the military in general, we are rife with, jar with jargon, uh, with idiosyncratic terms, uh, and, and with certain language. And we need to find ways to understand where does that come from? What kind of language are we using? And, and what is it communicating? Certainly the ability to use certain language communicates our identity and our membership in the group. But sometimes we also look at the words that we're actually using and see what they mean. All right, let's move on to the next one. So that's observable artifacts. And again, these are the things that we can see that are above the surface on that iceberg uh, metaphor. Below the surface are the values. Uh, the group, and you can kind of think of these as group norms at the organizational level. What are the concepts and beliefs um, around what we're doing? These values transcend situations and they're things that we all adhere to. Um, you know, certainly honor, courage, and commitment are organizational values. Uh, but there's probably some, also some other organizational values that are out there. And you should spend some time thinking about what are the values of your organization, whether it's your company, whether it's your division, uh, or your platoon, or whatever unit you end up in, what are the organizational values that are being imparted to you from the ship or from uh, the squadron or from wherever else? And, and how do you want to communicate those values on? Now, I want to make an important point here. A lot of organizations have what we call espoused values. These are things that they put up on a board someplace. Uh, they create a poster. They talk about them all the time, uh, et cetera. Oftentimes, there is a mismatch between these espoused values and the actual values of the organization, uh, or what we might call the enacted values. Now, I am not against espoused values. Certainly, we should put these things up. This is a way, and we'll talk about it more in a little bit, but this is a way that leaders uh, transmit and embed the kind of values that they want. Uh, honor, courage, and commitment didn't come from nowhere. Not everybody joins the Navy and the Marine Corps uh, fully embodying honor, courage, and commitment. 
So you have to spend time educating about these values, why they're important and how they come in. Um, but you should not expect, like there is an educational aspect to this and you should not expect that the values and beliefs just show up because you put them on a, a poster someplace. Uh, a lot of organizations, especially out in the commercial world, uh, tend to believe that. A lot of leaders tend to believe that and that's a mistake. Uh, and you should be aware of that, especially if there's a mismatch uh, between those espoused and enacted values. And you should spend some time learning what the enacted values are. Again, these are unobservable in many ways, other than by talking to people, by walking around, by getting out there uh, and, and figuring out how things work and what people actually believe. And then at the deepest layer of the organization are the basic underlying assumptions of the organization. Um, these are values that have become so ingrained over time that they are just assumptions about the way we work, um, right? So at the Naval Academy, we have a basic assumption that a good education lays a foundation for a future career in leadership. Um, we don't really even talk about it because it just it literally goes without saying uh, because that's part of our existence and why we exist. That is an example of a basic underlying assumption uh, that we have as the Naval Academy. Um, some companies may have a basic underlying assumption that uh, physical fitness is a core part of being an officer uh, and, is, and is more important than anything else that we do at the Naval Academy. Uh, and some companies may not have that, that uh, underlying assumption. And so you need to be aware of what the underlying assumptions are. Again, these are, these are the hardest things uh, to figure out. Uh, we, we can observe some artifacts, we can get some ideas. We can ask people and start to get an idea of organizational values. Uh, and even deeper in that than that is these underlying assumptions because people may not even be able to talk about what these are. They're not confronted or debated because people don't even know what they are because they're just never talked about. But they do inform how people behave because they provide, these assumptions then drive the quote unquote correct way to perceive a situation, way to think about it, and way to feel about it. Um, and so when we're diagnosing uh, a culture overall, these are the various things that we're going to look at. So when you're diagnosing a culture, one of your first jobs that you're going to want to do as a new division officer or a new leader uh, uh, is to find out what is the culture of your unit. Uh, and there are certain questions you can ask uh, to get there. What can be talked about? What can't be talked about? Uh, how do people wield power in this organization? How do you get ahead? How do you get in trouble? How do you stay out of trouble? What are the unwritten rules? Um, what are the morality and ethics? What are, how, do we, how do things operate? What are the ropes? How do things work around here? Right? We've heard that question before. Um, what stories are told about the organization, in the organization, out of the organization? These questions, and look, I didn't come up with this list of questions. You find it in the book. You find it in many books. Um, but these are the type of questions that you ask to do a deep dive on what the organizational culture is. 